Um, the photo soiree is a, a, essentially a, a private meeting of um, photographers on the happens in my house. Uh, the hailstorm um, did considerable damage to our ceilings and we can't really work there. And Connie um, Beachhold has very, very kindly stepped in at very short notice and said we could come and use this space for the presentation. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. Woo! It has that nice, kind of warm, friendly feel to it, so Dry. thank you very much. Um, the two artists, uh, both from overseas, they're both from Germany, um, they're both here for Head On, which of course is uh, a, a really important festival that's running at the moment. Um, I don't know if uh, some of you are visitors, or, um, some are local, but I think as locals we're really privileged to have something like Head On in our city and to be able to... Um, see such a wide variety of um, work. Um, now both the exhibitions that uh, Daniel and, and Thomas are showing are actually going to be on in Connie's gallery. They open tomorrow night. I think you'll get a sneak preview tonight. If you were lucky afterwards, if you behave well. Uh, <laughs> and um, so we're going to we're going to do the same kind of process that we do normally, where there'll be a short presentation, and then really what we're wanting to get is a conversation. So not just a Q and A, but actually, um, you know, a sense of uh, dialogue back and forth. But we're going to run them back to back, and so um, at an appropriate time, um, I'll kind of uh, move things over. Um, so our first speaker is Daniel. I'll introduce Thomas in a, um, in, in a moment. Well, uh, yes, uh, when we come to that. Um, so um, I was actually just asking Daniel, I couldn't quite remember. I knew we'd met at a festival somewhere in the world, and I knew we'd met at, um, I think, a portfolio review, or maybe, maybe we just met over a um, table, because it was in China. And uh, at Pinyao, and there, um, the wonderful thing about Pinyao is that people are meeting all the time at meals and so on. And um, I really liked the work he was showing me. Um, in in the very best sense of the word, he is a uh, Daniel's a humanist, and his sense of humanity in work um, about subjects which very easily could be made either sentimental or. Um, or shocking in some way, is really profound, I think. And um, I was very attracted, attracted to that kind of gentleness of telling the story. Mm -hmm. So um, I was delighted when we met again um, at the last Pinya. Uh, he was there showing another body of work, and then um, and it was a chance for Moshe to meet him, and um, Moshe saw the similar traits and mm -hmm. invited uh, Daniel to come and show at Head On. So I'm really very pleased to introduce to you now Daniel Sherman. Yeah, thank you, Alistair. Thank you, Connie, for hosting us. Um, welcome, everybody. I feel very honored to talk tonight about my project. I'm showing the project, as you can read, Princesses and Football Stars. I'm starting the timer so that I know how long I can talk. <laughs> um, and... Um, this project started in 2009, and the first version, basically, of the project is what Alistair has seen in 2010 in China. This um, once used to be my thesis from my university in Germany. I photographed families um, that had a life-threateningly ill child, and I photographed 29 of them I also published this work as a book, and I had the great opportunity to show this project in Pingyao. I actually had the chance through Thomas Kellner. I met him in 2008 in Birmingham, and so we are both Germans, but we more often meet in other countries. So he introduced my work to the curators in Pingyao, and then I met first Alastair, later Moshe, and now I'm very pleased to be mm -hmm. at the other end of the world and to show my project. Um, I slowly start into the project. My background <coughs> is 
that I did my civil service, with which you had to do in Germany until a couple of years ago instead of military service. I did this in a hospice. So I was working with mostly old people, but very sick people who would die um, very soon. And this was a very intense time. It um, yeah, definitely changed my way of thinking about life. And when I started studying in Germany, I really felt like that I need to work on this as a photographer that I want to approach this from a new point of view, so the point of view through the camera, so a more observing and maybe also researching point of view. So this is the project that you will see downstairs in the exhibition. Um, going from there, since after this project I felt like, yes, after doing the civil service, basically working as a nurse with dying people, it was really good to use photography in a way to um, yeah, explore my way of, yeah, I'm not, uh, English is not my native language, so I'm uh, sometimes searching for words, but, um, so, yeah. I found through this first project photography as a very good way to um, to ask questions to life and to try to find answers through my photography. And um, in this first project I worked with old people who already had yeah, a lot of years. Of course it would have been nicer for them to die in a different way, that's certain but um, they had the chance to get some experience during their life. And um, then I asked myself after finishing this project, how is this actually when people don't have this chance of getting experience throughout their life, when they are just at the beginning of their life and it's for it's yeah, way too early that they are confronted with a topic like dying and death. So I approached 29 people during my thesis, photographed them, traveled to their homes, and I think uh, this already was a good project, but when I was showing this project to Alastair, I realized there is a way of making this project even stronger, so I decided um, to choose ten, ten of these families that I already was photographing and to go back to these families, to visit them once a year. So, now in this projection I think it's hard to read, but under the picture you always can read the place where the pictures are taken and the months and year. So, since uh, 2009 I photographed them for the first time and then in 2011 I started going back to these families and since then I'm going back once a year. But um, I'm not only photographing them once a year, I'm <coughs> yeah, basically in a constant contact with these people. So a lot of them I would say became close friends in the meantime. And what happened I think especially in the last two years is that this project really changed and um, you've read the title Princesses and Football Stars in the first, in the beginning. I've chosen this title in 2009 because I was photographing in many children rooms and these children rooms present, represented <coughs> a healthy world basically, so a dream of a world without worries. And um, this was due to the reason that the children just couldn't spend a lot of time at home because they were so much time in the hospital. And at the other time, of, at the other hand, of course, they got a lot of uh, gifts and the, the parents were trying to yeah, represent in this room how it maybe would be 
without this illness, when they wouldn't have all these worries. So, um, but since I'm working on this project as a long-term project, I think it has changed in many ways. So it's no longer just about um, the illness, the worry and the fear, but um, it's much more about family. It's much more about how family um, stands together or also separates. It's about how people are getting older, how the concept of life changes. So I'm very thankful for that you pushed me in the direction of mm -hmm. turning this project in a long-term project. And um, yeah, I'm happy that this project became more layers, more depths, I would say, through keeping photographing. Here, for example, this is a family from South Africa. They moved to Germany a couple of years ago. This child has um, a genetical disease. This meant in the very beginning the child was seemed absolutely healthy, but when it was three years old, suddenly a decline um, started. It forgot everything that the child learned. Mm. And um, he is now, I think, 18 years old, but um, has almost no possibilities of communication. So, um, yeah, the only way of expression is his uh, smile. And fortunately, um, I go back. Yeah, in this picture, you can see that. The mother is a very good entertainer, fortunately. She is very good in telling stories. So I think in the way that is possible in this situation, the both of them are having a very good time. Um, but of course, the child doesn't really have the opportunity to express what he actually feels. And as you can see in every picture, um, they have enough medical stuff in the house to probably open a pharmacy. So, but the stories fortunately also develop in a different direction. So this is a child with leukemia. And in the next picture you already can see that the child this girl became much better over the period of yeah, almost two years. So the girl, Laura, has hair again and she feels much better. And what is actually interesting about this project, in the first years she um, never really was happy about having her picture taken, especially in the first one. She is still saying today that she doesn't want to look at this picture. She doesn't want to see herself without hair. And um, also in this year, it still was a challenge for the parents and myself to get her into the picture, to um, yeah, make her also understand why I'm doing this project. And then last year it actually changed since um, both of the parents are still in the picture but they got uh, separated yeah. and suddenly the two of them were arguing the whole time <laughs> and not that willing to be photographed <laughs> but the child was the one who was drawing them into the picture and to whom it was really important that both of them were photographed together Um, in all of these pictures, it's very important for me to photograph in color, to photograph, in this case, also with daylight, or if I photograph inside, I'm using strobe, but I'm using it in a way that I yeah, basically imitate daylight, 
And I'm doing this for the reason because I want to show these people as natural as possible. I want to show that this is not an abstract situation, that um, of course they are in a situation where none of us hopes to ever be in, but it's still part of life that you're confronted with death, mm -hmm. that you're confronted with illness. And of course these people are still hoping for yeah, um, a life that is as normal as possible, that they are hoping to be still respected by society. Often it happens that um, people around them can't deal with the situation they are in and friends suddenly turn away. So I'm yeah, trying to show through the way how I photograph these people, I'm trying to show respect and to um, yeah, do the opposite what other people do. So turn towards them to show, yes, you are still important and um, no matter how um, dramatic your situation is, of course you are still a valuable part of society. And of course, um, so as you can see in this picture, the mother lost her son. Mm -hmm. So this is, of course, another part of the story. Her son died a few months after the first picture. And she unfortunately uh, yeah, is herself in a very bad situation since she is uh, suffering a lot under um, the loss of her son. What happened to the father? Um, they, he is alive, but they got uh, separated, I think. Um, now, in their case, I'm not sure. So many of these families got separated due to the illness and that they couldn't handle this <coughs> within the family. In this case, I'm not sure, but... Um, Yeah, here it's definitely the case that the father uh, dropped out because he couldn't handle the illness. And I'm photographing all these families either at home or in places that are important for them because I'm only having this one picture per year so I'm want, I want to use this picture to tell as much as possible about these people. So I want Usually to show. with their children, due to the fact that they got separated, oh. they are still both in a good contact and both take care of the children. This is why I photographed both of them. But in the new picture from last year, 2014, I photographed the mother now with her new partner who is also fortunately taking care of the children. Yeah, this is an amazing family. This child um, has, is very intelligent, but can almost not move. The, but boy? Yes. the boy or the girl? The boy, yes. Mm. And, um, but he is, as you can see in the room, a great soccer fan, especially now on this picture. <laughs> and um, yeah, I really like how the mother is um, fighting for her children and tries to make everything possible so that I think in, yeah, not this picture, but in the next one you can see that at uh, the wheelchair, at the lower end of the wheelchair there is this metal plate and this allows him to actually play soccer with this wheelchair. <laughs> and um, yeah, so he enables him to still be active and as much as possible involved into soccer. And um, he now also has this dog with, who can uh, grab things yeah. that uh, the boy drops. And, of course, also here the family has changed, of course, 
both of the children are growing, but the mother also got married again. And um, yeah, so th I think this is also a very nice development. Even though in the next picture, so this is 2014, but in the 2015 picture, most likely um, the older sister uh, won't be in the picture anymore since she moved to her real father because she felt like that um, being in this family she doesn't get enough attention. Of course, an ill child needs much more attention than a healthy child. So she feels like being with her father she is much better off. Any more questions? Uh, just in one, one of the earlier photographs, you had, you had to convince the child to be in the photograph. Mm -hmm. What I'm interested in what the positive outcomes, the act, the act of photography you're using, is, it, is there's positive outcomes both for you and also for them. Can you just explain a little bit about what they actually, what their emotional response or what they get out of the process and what you get out of the process as well? Mm -hmm. Just in simple words, yeah? Um, now, of course, they got get the pictures, so this is for some of them already a very important uh, thing to have, since they don't know how long they will be to get all together. So um, having a photograph with all the family members is very important to them, and um, yeah, then of course, what I mentioned earlier to just have somebody coming out of, I would say, the healthy society, um, being interested in them is very important. And of course, this project um, also, I'm trying to help other people I'm not photographing with this project to show here there are families who are maybe in the same situation, in a similar situation like you, but also um, found a way to handle the situation. And um, yeah, for myself, I definitely would say that um, one very important. Um, resume for me in meeting all these families is that it's just amazing even though their situation is so difficult that um, that there is still so much love for this child and that pe uh, that these people are so strong to fight for their children to make their life the limited time they have as positive as good as possible. And of course I um, very much like to see in this long-term project how family also outside the illness uh, develops. How do you come to know these people? Um, I had this first project that you will see downstairs from uh, the hospice and um, I yeah, had fortunately already the uh, published book when I started this project, so I went to uh, children hospices and children hospitals yeah. and showed my book and presented my idea, my concept, what I wanted to do. And then they started asking their patients if they could imagine to participate. And it, I actually... Um, thought it would be a much longer and much diff more difficult process to find people. In the end, it uh, turned out it was quite easy mm. to uh, convince them to participate. And you always wanted to photograph them at home or somewhere, because that's what's most, you know, you mm -hmm. have, there's nothing medical, it's normalizing things really. Yes. Um, yeah, on the one hand side, it's, it's normalizing, it's as you it say. As more, no, more Mm -hmm. A lot of pictures you see of ill children are in hospital, mm -hmm. yes. um, which is very, very different from, from this. Have you had any families that felt uncomfortable about the way you portrayed them? Like, have they felt disappointed? Or are they all, they're all happy for that? 
Um, as much as I know, they are all happy with how I'm photographing this. I mean, there are, um, of course, I'm photographing them. I'm not only taking this picture, I'm photographing them in uh, different situations to also see later on in which, which picture is better reflecting how I um, felt this day about this family. And um, now so far, or it sometimes happened that the family thought they would maybe like this picture better than the other. Um, but with my ideas of why I've chosen a specific picture, I always could convince them that <laughs> this is a picture to, to choose. <laughs> and, and do you have like a, a model release that they sign? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. I do. And they give you the copyright? Yes. So, yeah, the, um, all the pictures from 2000, 2009 already have been published as a book. And um, I, I'm certainly planning to also publish this as a book. But, um, yeah, right now I'm not sure how long I actually will be working on this project. Maybe for another three years, maybe even longer. That's, yeah, depends on... Um, how long these families are willing to cooperate and... Do you find your role has evolved, you know, from being an artist or observer interpreter to being, as you mentioned, a friend, maybe some aspects of kind of therapy even. Mm -hmm. um, are you comfortable with that? How does that affect what you're doing? Um, no, I mean, there are... Uh, mm -hmm certainly situations where I'm struggling. Um, but I would say that I did my civil service in the hospice before definitely was a very good way of um, yeah, prepare myself for the situation. And um, <laughs> later on there will be a family, so also this family um, lost one of their children. Yeah, I mean, I would find this but really confronting, turning up every year, year after year, with the memory of no child. But, um... Quite hard. Now, yes and no. Mm -hmm. So, um, they actually told me if I would uh, turn away from them and suddenly oh. no longer be interested mm -hmm. in them, this would be much harder than wow, so meeting yeah. me Every it's, year um, again. Celebrating the memory. Of their and um, mm -hmm. I mean, they anyway have all the pictures still in their house of mm -hmm. their child, so they are um, yeah, every day confronted. Them, yeah. mm -hmm. They don't want to forget their child. Either. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one of the strengths of Daniel's work is that he views the family as a holistic thing. Yeah. It's not the child as a spectacle. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think that that is a, is a, is a very important thing. We we. We do live in a society which um, valorizes health mm. and tends to wish to shut away illness. So families who have children who are disabled in some way or, or um, less healthy um, are generally not, people don't want to know too much. They'd rather it was kind of just, you know, it's a little distasteful. And so I, I can see that um, while in some ways there are emotional challenges to this, these people have gone through enormous oh, emotional challenges. They will have a very kind of balanced view, I think, really, of, of, of where this kind of thing sits in. And what it does is to show these are, in a sense, ordinary families. They have an extraordinary thing to deal with, but they are ordinary people living ordinary lives, and um, sometimes relationships continue and sometimes they don't. One of the things that I really appreciate when Daniel did decide to make this a, a, a longer body of work is that he didn't, as soon as the child yeah. died, if the child died, because some yeah. of them survived, say, well, that's it, because that was what I was interested that's in. It. But actually look at the healing process, and that can take a long time. Sometimes it can have that destructive phase the way we saw with, with uh, one of the um, adults. But um, I think seeing that through as well, is important, and yes, of course, it's important for others to see so that they can get some sense of not being alone if they're in that situation. But I, th mm -hmm. I think also for the people involved, it, 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 um, 
it gives value and it gives presence to a situation that actually uh, I think our society doesn't want to um, really take on board. You know, we'd rather, mm -hmm. I mean, we're happy to see it funded and all that kind of thing, we just kind of don't want to become emotionally entangled in it. And that must yeah. be a very difficult situation for a family to be in, not for people not to want to become emotionally entangled with you, you know? Yeah, this yeah. is an interesting series. This, mm -hmm. these ones, yeah. Still ask me to do this in front of my pictures. So, um, yeah, um, smile and oh, have really? a selfie together. No, they're, they're rabbit ears. Every time you have a photo taken, you put, you put rabbit ears. Yeah. Up. It's, it's just a thing. You do. Not a big but, but, yeah. but um, yeah, I also have to say there was an artist talk. And um, during this artist talk, I really was surprised that uh, still there was the difficulty of uh, translation, that it was translated all the time between Chinese and English. And still, there, there definitely were some uh, really good questions. So this, on the other hand, surprised me to have this contrast between obviously some of them really could. Uh, understand what was going on and others just smile and peace. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued about the concept of a book. Uh, I mean, it's not your average subject matter for a book. Mm -hmm. uh, where has it been sold, for example? Um, now, the book, actually, the first book has been published as all my other books uh, with art publishers and um, yeah I mean I'm trying to publish the book um, as well for the, the art world and uh, for people who are actually um, in this situation yeah. and yeah so I mean of course it's uh, not an easy topic to sell no. And it took quite a while to find a publisher and to find financing for the book. But um, the responses so far are definitely very good. And for example, the first book um, that is shown downstairs, I have still a co few copies for myself, but uh, from the publishing house it's sold out. So there, are, there is an audience, obviously. Uh, how, how many do they publish? Um, it ranges between, uh, so, yeah, the book from the hospice, there are 1,000 copies, and the project that I did later on about gay couples and gay families in San Francisco, there are 2,500 uh, 2, copies. And that would have sold out? Uh, not yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, so you've seen all pictures. Are there any more questions? Okay, so um, we just need to change the quotes over. Does that mean no? No. I can tap down for a while. Any more questions? I see you again. Beautifully thought through and, and uh, felt through, if you like, um, answers to really complicated questions, um, which partly I think come from um, the strangeness that, in a way, you're alluding to by showing an, an opposite view. The strangeness we have about ill health and about dying. I, I, the experience I had visiting a friend in a hospice was actually how much more uplifting it was than going to a hospital. In a exactly. hospital, someone is dying is a yeah. failure. Yeah. In a hospice, yeah. somebody is living, mm. yeah. and they focus on that. Mm. And um, that's what I get from your photographs. It's, yeah. it's this ability of ordinary human beings in a family to absorb these things and to live, to, to create life around them. It's mm -hmm. wonderful. So thank you very much. Mm. Thank you. So it's my great pleasure and honor now to introduce Thomas Kellner to you. I, I met Thomas, I think, at the Houston Photo Fest, which is a, a, the, one of the most kind of um, full-on meeting place in portfolio reviews, um, sort of almost a heavy industry 
version of that where you, you see people. And you, so you see a lot of things, and it takes something really strong to stand out, and, and uh, Thomas's work certainly um, stands out, and, uh, and since then we've met at a number of other festivals. Um, I wouldn't say architectural photography is something that particularly normally attracts me, but the idea of architecture that dances, and dances in a particularly difficult way in which it's choreographed by Thomas, is absolutely mesmerizing, and I, I can look at his pictures all day. So I'm um, really pleased to introduce Thomas Kellner to you to talk about his work. Thank you. Well, we are now in contact, well, 13 years, I think. That's really mm. like a long distance that we know each other. Yes. And it's a real pleasure that you are organizing this evening, and thanks to Connie and Florian for hosting us here. Thank you all for coming. I want to give you an insight in what I'm doing, where I come from. And to start with, well, yes, I'm close to 50. I'm doing this already since a, time, a long time. I was born in the former capital in Bonn. I'm living in a city called Siegen, which is uh, the birthplace of Peter Paul Rubens. And as we are talking about photography, it's the birthplace of Bernard Becker. Beckers, you have heard of. So the, if you know about their typologies and visualize the, the first series of the black and white framework houses, this is exactly where I come, uh, live now. Zander mm -hmm. also lived around the corner, August Zander. Uh, lived in Herdorf, which is just 10 kilometers away from where I live. And when I finished my studies in '96, I thought, well, those guys had a reason to stay here, so why not stay instead of going to Berlin, London, Paris? Um, since 2002, when we met, uh, that meeting place, uh, portfolio meeting place in Houston, really gave me absolutely everything that I have today. I found a gallery in Chicago who did fantastic for me. I found a gallery in New York. I found, I think in, in the f follow up of that festival, I found three more books, uh, invitations to festivals, to commissions, to residencies, everything. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a visiting professorship for one year in Germany. And mm -hmm. after that, I decided I have no more time for day jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so since 2004, since 11 years, I'm really making my living as an artist upon my princess. So what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about how it all started. You saw already the first image. Uh, so I want to talk about the influence of cubism and the Eiffel Tower into my work. I want to explain how I do these images, of course. The last project titled Genius Lucky did well, let's see, brought some important changes. And in the end, I give you an insight in the different groups of images that I did where I started monument, monuments of European buildings. This is where we met. Later, I photographed interiors, dancing walls, uh, Oscar Niemeyer buildings in Brasilia. And what we show here in the gallery uh, is the series of Tango Metropolis. You see, I started in architecture very early. <laughs> Your parents so, were photographers. Sorry? Your parents were photographers. My parents, my mother was an art teacher, and my father was a music teacher. And uh, I, of course, I, lo I started learning instruments, like fl different flutes up to uh, saxophone. But uh, when it was about a uh, higher school level, I really had to decide where do I want to go, fine arts or music. I had the time that you ha have left over as a, as a pupil, a side of sports, is so limited, so I had to decide for either arts or music. Mm. And I decided for arts. So when I studied, I was very lucky to have a teacher from Düsseldorf, from the academy, who was mm -hmm. trained as a sculptor. So he first taught sculpture at our university and then tumbled into pinhole photography at the late 80s. 
which was an absolutely full, uh, I was lucky to meet him at the time because he was teaching the basics of photography and the basics of experimenting. Here, with pinhole ca cameras, I learned that photography is much more than what the industry makes us believe. Mm -hmm. It's far more. There's much more possible in what can be understood as photography. And especially the machines that we use, these cameras, are only made for industry purpose. If you think camera different, this room can be a camera. My yeah. mouth can be a yes, camera. I've seen those photos. Yeah, you saw Thomas Bachler <laughs> mouth pictures. So I created all kinds of cameras from little cans for film. I, I converted a Bible uh, into a holy uh, pinhole Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, the very long one that was for the whole length of a, of a film, so I could do a panorama on a 35 millimeter film with 20 pinholes from the back and from the front. It's so all the same. And I created this camera. These multiple pinhole cameras were important because from the very beginning, I was completely bored through by looking through the viewfinder and ask myself, why shall I press a button? I see it. And my teachers also told me, if you are doing fine art, it means create something new. Create something. What you see is already there. You don't need to create that. It. It's already created. So if, if it's about doing something new, then uh, no press the button and we do the rest does not work for me. So uh, I built pinhole cameras and in this project I worked with six different cameras. So I tried to build a panorama. I, I was known as the butcher for my girlfriend that time. Uh, <laughs> um, but I also had this camera with 11 pinholes working on one sheet of a negative. So I could open the shutters for 11 different images or for the same and make a co and make a collage without seeing what I had only in mind on one negative so could look like this or I learned and that was important I can turn the camera around for each shot <laughs> yeah so why keep the camera in one direction you can turn it around around which direction ever it gives it in the end it forms a different image cubism well I was trained to become a teacher like my mother so I had to study art history and my main subject for exams was uh, cubism and especially uh, Robert Delaunay and you probably know these three key images of cubism. This is uh, La Mademoiselle uh, d'Avignon from Picasso, the nude descending the, the stairs from Marcel Duchamp, and the fenêtre simultanée from Robert Delaunay. These three images I still have in mind as something important to me because the, the principles of photography are, are based on Renaissance. A central perspective. Fine art, where I come from, has overcome that totally. If you look downstairs here in the gallery or in the program of Connie, you see concrete art. There is no central perspective anymore. So why is photography still there? For me, sorry, it's kind of boring that uh, this concept of, of image is Renaissance old and we try not to overcome that. <laughs> I'm thinking about the image and how can I find in photography a different way for to create a photogra photographic image that follows these ideas of the abstract image. So cubism, for me, is one possibility. These, these are some of the Eiffel Towers that Robert Delaunay painted up to, up to the very abstract in the bottom red. And I was like all, all of our careers are driven by that. Uh, you get a phone call 
you are invited by a friend. I had a friend who said, well, come to Paris. I have a studio in Paris, which was a tiny little apartment. I'm not there, use it. I said, hoorah, I've never been to, in Paris. I go to Paris for the first time in my life, and what I knew from earlier in my studies was when I go on a journey, I need to take pictures. It's like all photographers do that. But for me, more special, I wanted to convert an, exp an, an experience into my own artwork. So I had the plan. I wanted to do something similar to the work of Robert Delaunay. But I was out of a university. I had no machines anymore to create these pinhole cameras. So I was thinking how to do that. And I came to the conclusion that a contact print could be a, a proper medium to do a sketch for what I was aiming for. So here you see some of the early sketches that I did on that travel, and some of the first Eiffel Towers. I did a set of first 10 images, just experimenting. I had no idea how the, the architecture and this strips, the structure of the contact sheet, would affect each other. I mean, really no clue. The only thing that I knew from uh, my studies in history of photography were early uh, grids and contact sheets from the amateur clubs in the 60s and uh, one Polaroid grid uh, from Hockney uh, that I had seen in a book. So these were the first images that I did, a set of 10. I traveled home. And this image really stuck in my mind for, ten, for, for two years. The following two years, I went on photographing, trying different ways, keeping it straight, uh, turning to color. I photographed in Berlin and uh, other places. And then things happened for good or for the bad. I had a bad accident. Uh, I, had, I cut the ten of Achille. Say that? Achilles, 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 Achilles tendon. Achilles tendon. Completely, I couldn't work for half a year and had to decide whether I go teaching at school to pay off my credits <laughs> that were piling uh, or to understand where the market is. And I was kept thinking about this image and another one. And I knew that the Brits were uh, asking me to photograph London in color. So I did that. So, back to the question, how do I do that? This is a, as a shot from my Brazilian project, standing in a cathedral. This is how I see that, with a camera. When I create these contact sheets, I'm completely free in, with, like, with a canvas. I can do a horizontal panorama, I can do a vertical, a square, I can do something very tiny or something very big. I'm completely free. So I have to do a sketch, either in mind or in reality in my sketchbook. I brought one of my sketchbooks for what I'm framing it. And after that, I have to decide, as you see here, uh, for a storyboard that includes the number of frames that I would shoot horizontally and vertically with a certain lens and how I divide this up on my tripod so I can control this virtual grid that I'm photographing everything in sequence. So, till today, there is no digital manipulation. It's completely analog. Not completely anymore, we are printing digitally, but uh, the, the shot is on negative and it's all scotch taped. And, and why do you choose to do that? Yeah. When I started to photograph this, I told you about the first Eiffel Towers. The contact sheet was a sketch, and it took me two years to understand that I had found 
something absolutely beautiful and wonderful and something that no one did before me in history of photography. Something that we, some call it deconstruction, others call it or whatever, uh, but to a whole oeuvre in a contact sheet was never done. To find such a niche in photography is almost impossible to find that. I mean, we have a history that is older than 175 years now, I think so. Um, it's almost impossible. And on top of that, when I started, end of the 90s, there was digital already. And I knew one day we will lose this material. So, hell, someone has to work with the material when we want to understand fine art. Uh, we know today when we talk about, uh, let's go back to Connie's gallery again, about concrete art downstairs, you really have to talk about the chalk, the color, the materiality. There is nothing else, there is no image. There is the object itself and its material and its shape. And in photography, so far, there were photograms, yes. There were chemigrams, all the experimental side of photography, but did someone really use the film as an essential part of the image? No, no one. And 35 millimeter film, sorry, is the basis for Hollywood. Hollywood would not exist without the 35 millimeter film. Yeah, Leica would not exist. I mean, for Leica that was invented, but uh, all our visual, uh, the history of our visual technical image is mainly based on the 35 millimeter film and the 120, of course. Uh, so I decided, give it a chance, put the material into the image, and really treat the material like uh, the pigment and the canvas and the stroke of the brush. The stroke of the brush is more my movement that I'm, I'm using. Does it answer? Mm -hmm. I think, no, I'm not sure. I'll give you an insight. No, there is how you see it. As a beautiful place. That's 35 mil film, each one of those. Yes, yes. Each picture is an individual frame on 35 millimeter. And it's all in sequence, row by row. That's many rows of film. Well, sometimes I use, the, the, the starting concept was I use one roll for one image instead of one roll for 36 or 24. Uh, today I'm using, uh, what's the biggest? I think the biggest is up to 60 rolls for one image. Wow. And sorry I have to go out when you were talking about your cameras, but are you like going like that or are you using one camera with another? No, I'm using one camera that goes from the bottom left and then goes up line by line. And you've got a tripod that a tripod. measures this off and goes click. No, no, I have measured it before and I make the scaling like, like I showed you on the sketch. Okay, I'm impressed. Yeah. So you're using what you're looking at to mark where the Well, technically it's, technically it's completely easy. Yeah. I mean, no. <laughs> what's really intriguing is that you have the whole storyboard yeah. calculated mathematically in your head, and that is what is intriguing. I decide for what my image is, yeah. and then I decide whether I want to break it into big portions to make it very cubic, or in little segments, fragments, that are more shivering, and I can create different forms of moving and compositions. Do you ever find that the grid structure that you've got on top is constraining? It's not on top, that is the contact sheet. Yeah, I know I understand it's a contact sheet, but, but yeah. in all your pictures, you've, got a, you, you've still got the, the black, the grid of the contact sheet, so visually that's, is that you find that a constraint? No, I don't know the word constraint. No, it's not a limitation. It's um, a 
that's what you see the digital time we have photographers uh, doing this digital uh, we know the work of Hockney who did it with Polaroid then you have the white lines uh, here you have on top the, the material you have the perforation you have the coding you have the numbers mm. you can really read this image by, by its numbers mm. and, and follow my process so it, it, it really helps it, it, it might be that it disturbs you that there is a black grid but I, I tell you like the my experience with the interior images was we can see these images uh, like you say that uh, stained glass. glasses, stained glass, glass. Stained glass. Stained glass. Yes. windows. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So once you get this idea, you suddenly look differently onto onto the black, and it, it changes really from image to image because the small image, the black, is bigger and confronting a bigger portion of the architecture, and the the small the more frames it has, uh, the the finer the structure becomes. I'm a bit intrigued. As, mm. as you do this, say for the top of that image, you've got your tr the camera up high, because so, it's not distorted. No, no, no. You know, it depends very much on how much I want to bow behind the camera mm. and where the object is. But there's no real distortion, you know, if you're looking... No, I control the image. I decide is what that, is the the, the, the the top left and the, the bottom left. The question is about the difference between tracking and tilting. Yeah. You mean this? You, are you, when you do up and down, are you tracking the camera up and down, or are you tilting it? Yeah, I'm tilting it. Yeah, oh. so that's... Because the question is about perspective change. Yeah, 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 but I'm, I'm tilting it and I control the image. Also, but there's, also, there's not much distortion because no. you're doing very small pieces. There is a lot of distortion. <laughs> 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 and it's about distortion. I think some of your images are a lot more distorted than that, so maybe if you show some more... We will see later. Sense of I want to... Yeah. Yeah. I think what is really intriguing, in my observation of this, is it seems to be dancing and flowing and creative, yet it is completely controlled. Whatever is there, that's how you want to do it. So I think the, the, the balance of, um, of, of analytic and creativity is perfectly come here in, in, in into a balance. This is the beauty of it. Yeah, there's a lovely flowing movement. You know, there's an art deco mm -hmm. the light. It is, it is a record. It is a record, like a painting or a performance. Or a performance has been held. Uh, if I would do it the second time, it would be similar, but not exactly the same. I want to give you a little insight in my living. We don't have sound, right? No, we have sound now. Yeah, that should be okay. So we'll see a little bit of my, my studio and where I live. Hi. <laughs> Alright, that's my studio, just mounting negatives. Oh, that's it? Right. Little tour through my studio with all the books. Of course, naturally. Uh, five meters of a desk. Next room has another six meters of a desk. Uh, there we're researching for definitions. You see a storage full of wow. frames and books. Wow. There's about 500 frames there for exhibitions. I like the light box. Oh, fabulous light box. Uh, you cannot see that. Uh, where we'll see that on the screen there later again. So actually planning exhibitions and, and work so we use about 20 meters of my uh, wall in the studio to make a work complete work work schedule but because right now I'm planning projects and exhibitions for about the next 15 years so some of the images 
Uh, you see one of the mounted negatives here. That's home. So, what are you mounting them onto? What are you mounting the legs onto? I'm just scotch taping them. So you print them like that? You we used to we used to print them like analog, mm. but uh, today there is no more analog laboratories mm. for to print that, and they have become too big. So we are now using a hybrid system where I'm scanning the whole sheet of uh, plastic and we are printing lambda C prints. Oh, lambda. So, so the end result was a C print and is a C print. Yeah. So I'm just using this tool of a computer. So no, no analog even in Germany? Well, there is. Well, the fantastic thing is, when you work like that, from time to time you get an email or a phone call that was... Uh, that's analog, right? <laughs> that is the old analog, but that's, that's the real red phone uh, at the mission, co mission control in Houston. That man here. Um, some of you asked me, and that was the title for, for the beginning. A, whole, this, a career is really driven by you put your work out, and you meet people like Alistair, and uh, then you have people like Moshe inviting you uh, to come for exhibition, or you have people asking you, can you please, uh, and this came from Russia, very surprising, uh, design an exhibition for the 219th anniversary of Yekaterinburg, which is in the Russian Urals, um, for a museum show. And I said, why? Well, they said, this guy was born in your city, and he is the founder of Yekaterinburg. I said, oh, well, you know that? In Germany, no one knows that. <laughs> well, well, someone knew uh, a good part of that story, and had he in the 70s had found uh, the, his name in our church book, oh, but he wow. forgot to prove that other cities in Netherlands, in England, and other places in Germany were also claiming to be his birthplace. So for one year, I had to run around and to run these contract proofs. Today, we have 100% uh, certainty that this is the guy that the Russians know, and he's important. He is Yekaterinburg is the fourth biggest city in Russia. Yeah. He founded many other cities. And he is the first in the Russian history of industry who did a documentation. He did the very early, in the 17th century, he wrote a documentation, a documentary, with handwritten paintings about the situation of industries in the Russian Euros. Wow. Mm -hmm. So this is why every historian in Russia knows this guy. He goes highly decorated by Peter the Great, and uh, he's a fantastic figure to talk about. And I said, oh, that's true. Now let's take this as a reason, because he uh, went to Russia with all his knowledge on steel. My city is on st about steel, first digging for steel and melting. Today it's uh, high machine production. And we know the Beckers are so famous for their industrial images. And I thought, okay, now it's the time that I can do also something about industrial architecture. Let's do a project on industrial industries in Russia, in Germany, bring them both together as a bridge in one exhibition. You haven't investigated to see if you might be related. Sorry? <laughs> you haven't done any investigation to see if you are related to him. Uh, no, 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 no. I come from a different part of Germany. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm, living in <laughs> I'm living in that town now since uh, 25 oh, okay. years. Um, but I've I found that really uh, a challenge to work on industries, to find something mm -hmm. in Russia to photograph there, in Germany, wrote a concept how to do that, and really new in this project you can see maybe there is movement only in these parts here. Mm -hmm. here. The basis of the image usually is straight, mm -hmm. it's like uh, an architecture needs a, a basis to stand on. 
I found out the picture needs that too. It's almost not possible to turn around a, 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 a photo. A painting sometimes needs mm -hmm. to be on the head. Yes? <laughs> um, and you see this structure keeps straight. So in this project, I'm using a different form of concepts. I'm not writing a storyboard for every single shot anymore. But I want to create a, a composition that confronts movement and steady. Can I ask what lens are you using? Lenses! I'm using, okay, let's... you're very close and suddenly you're very, I mean, my God, I've, there's something occurred to me that you must be using quite a zoom Let's over pull there. out the whole technical question. Um, I'm using a Manfrotto uh, tripod mm -hmm. uh, with a, a individual manufactured um, circle on, on the head, so I have enough room to write the scaling. It's a three-way uh, head and I'm working with a Pentax camera. And lenses, analog, I have from 24 with converters up to 4,000. Right, because you've got just one little picture way up there, just a little bit of the stack. Depends very much, yeah. yeah? I mean, uh, depends on the, on the distance that I have to the object, and depends on the size of image that I want to do. Yeah. yeah, if I'm very close and I want to do a, uh, a little picture, it's like that. I don't need much lens. Mm -hmm. The same person is very far away. The, the angle gets very narrow, but I need a lot of lens. It's the same lens within one picture. It's one lens for one picture, and it's one aperture, and it's one shutter wow. time. So you're not zooming in and out during the No, picture. no, no, you change the aperture then. You cannot do that. So for an image like this, how long would it take you to shoot? I usually need, just for the technical setup, it's 30 to 45 minutes. And then shooting depends very much uh, an hour or two up to six hours when it's a night shot. So that's dangerous if the weather... Weather change. I will sh show you later also. Um, I need like a clear blue sky. I need a constant light situation for to get through the whole image. Yes. I cannot come back another time. I no. will not find the same... Uh, also, the sun, the sun moves off the image as well, so obviously you need to work before the sun moves away from the image. I have one image that shows that directly. So just comparing the, the storyboards that I used, these were the former ones. Sometimes I'm only making some notes because it's a left-right rhythm and I'm changing that a little bit from the bottom to the top. And today, it's more concepts saying this portion is straight, there is a movement. Or here I shake the tower. Or might get really complicated in details with notes for the sky, for the bottom, or for some details where I change the structure of movement. So it's sort of like the, the husband and wife is at Becca who went around and photographed all those industrial objects together and in black and white they, they made as about just a they made, they, what the Beckers really made, and which is absolutely fantastic that they managed that, is they introduced the term of typology into fine arts. The term of typology did not exist in fine art before. They did not introduce a documentary photography. They used documentary photography to explain typology. So that was one of the last images. And this will be uh, a new starting point in the near future. You see, there, this form is almost like the Eiffel Tower. So what are these? This is the number of the negatives, all the positives. Uh, you mean near this? Yes. This is splitting up the image in different zones for different movements. So. Would you, you couldn't move the tripod, could you? You have to do it all from the one spot. It's one spot. Yeah. If you don't want to use one spot, you need to bring rails. And they are really heavy for the suitcase. It doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you have to show different movements, are you tilting the camera? Yeah. Movements? Showing you oh, the okay. result yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. 
I keep this straight, and then this is falling towards the middle. So, so the, the, the shot you did of the Eiffel Tower, though, it, the approach was much more radical. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, that was very much following cubism. Yeah. The idea of cubism. Because it really broke it up. And since then, the whole idea has taken off its, its own no. way. Mm. Well, that's just you're more in control now. Well, this is now. This is this is now getting to a control, a different control level. Yes. Yeah. Here's the sketch again. Oh, it's the wrong wrong direction. Here's the Eiffel Tower sketch again. Let's go li quickly a little bit back. Have you question? More questions up here. Have you tried humans? Yeah, I did. I did. Very, very difficult. Because who stands still? Who stands still? Who stands still? But chaos. Yeah. Well, in the very beginning, the the images were really very small. They were like A4 size. Very small. But from the structure that I was shaking, very impressive. Of course, people were saying, like, these structures are falling down. Wow. Yeah, Stonehenge. Uh, the creative part in that was that you can almost can photograph these stones in one frame, but I wanted a picture in these different dimensions. So I took the bottom here. A piece here, you see here's already the sky, and I didn't put the sky completely, you see the repetitions here. So that's a lot smaller because you burned out. Yeah, it's, it's really flat. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the images I had the most fun with. Yeah. 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 And I went to, to uh, London to the artist fairs and the families on the Sunday with uh, baby chairs and the small children going through and small children always say, Hey, Daddy, Mommy. <laughs> <laughs> London bridges falling down, falling down. Yeah, yeah. started singing, yeah? That's yeah. the song. <laughs> um, in 2003, I got a phone call from, from Boston asking me to uh, work on interiors uh, for the 200th anniversary of a library, the second biggest but oldest private library in the <coughs> States. But I had no experience with interiors. Because I'm, am I a photographer? No. I'm a trained uh, artist. I know how to press uh, the button on the camera, but technically I have really no clue. Yeah? Um, using strobes, ne I never did. So I'm a daylight photographer, so I, I only have, I can only use daylight. These were the interiors of the library. I still have the smell of the books in my, oh. my nose. I was photographing there for three, three weeks. Oh, one shot in the morning, one oh. shot in the afternoon, yeah? Uh, using the little light that was reaching in between the books. And of course, oh. for that project, I had to experiment and I was lucky to get an invitation to Genoa with other artists from all over Europe and here I started to go on the stairs of the palacios into the yards and later also shooting the first interiors. And I, as I was working on that and I was in contact with, you know, John Bennett in, in New York, he called me and said, well, you know, um, we like your work, and there is the new tower in New York. Uh, little backwards, 9-11 was really a problem for me. And I was shooting the monuments in the beginning, before going to America. From 9-11 on, in May 2001, I had my first book published. By September, I could not sell a single print anymore. 
people were saying, we only see your, the falling towers of New York. Oh. We cannot, yes. we, we dislike your work. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, half a year later, in beginning 2002, that's where we met, I went to uh, the States and the, the Americans were completely different. They said, well, history brought a new meaning to your work. Interesting. Interesting fact was that this happened and the Hearst family really, this is uh, the, the very rich family that owns uh, Cosmopolitan magazine and a uh, big family. They decided to tear down uh, their old building and create a new skyscraper in New York, second line to uh, Central Park. They signed the contract for this when the second plane hit wow. the towers. They signed that. And it was the first skyscraper that got finished after 9-11. And as they were thinking what to gift to the family, the Hearst family, they call, called 10 artists to create an artist portfolio that they gave to the Hearst family and all the others who were involved in that. And I decided to turn the inside of the Hearst Tower into the same cubic structure like Foster does that in the outside. So just to explain the two towers, were they somehow related to the Hearsts? No. They were not related. It just happened that yeah. they signed the contract mm -hmm. for their own new skyscraper on that day wow. when the second plane hit the, the towers. Wow. And it was the first skyscraper that was finished after that. Yeah, I was at a, at a fair in New York and a collector bought two prints, I remember it was one of the Genoa images and the capital from Washington. And he approached me and said, what do I need to do to get you to Mexico, to shoot Mexico? I want to be the first one publishing your work. No. I said, well, put me on a plane, sit me in a hotel, give me an assistant and a car and pay for the material and the scans. Well, six weeks later, I found myself four weeks in a hotel in Mexico. Yeah. Wow. I had a chance, first time traveling to China, mm. and to see this gets really completely fragmented. You can mm. almost not identify anything mm. in this picture. Is it the TV tower? No, this, no. this is a factory hall, a turbine factory. Mm. Here you see the situation, it's me and the camera. And of course, that takes a long time, and in China you have an interpreter and a guard, and this is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just takes so long, they got bored. Um, <laughs> um, no, he's, they are both really good friends of mine and they both also smile. Um, it's ex exhausting for them and for me when we uh, work together for exhibitions or for projects. Right after Houston, I got also invited to show part of this exhibition here in Brasilia. And I did this first picture and I thought, okay, I'm done. I have the key image for Brasilia. But something was strange. I got really intrigued with this concrete architecture out of cement with no structure. Um, very inhuman today when the city was built for humans and I started working on Brasilia also because I found out there is the 50th anniversary of the city very soon that was in 2009 and I saw a chance to interfere with my work with an artistic work in the early visual history of a city no chance to do it anywhere else. Every city is very old. And here is a city that is only 50 years old and I could do a work that is different to documentary. And see, I hope in the long run, if this has an influence on the visual history of that city. This is the Congress inside. You know, you know these two shapes of the Congress. 
Uh, how large a scale, how big are the prints you're doing now, like a piece, how big do you reproduce them now? Uh, I print them contact size. Oh, okay. Right. So this is much bigger than the original. The original is 70 centimeters. Okay. This was the first supermarket in Brasilia, the capital. And of course, as I started traveling around the, the globe, I got intrigued in what we call the, the new world wonders. Chinese wall, and there is your question with light. And this has a different composition also, but you can see here the light is orange, yellow, on the wall, with sharp shades here. By here it turns into mm. blue and no sun anymore. Mm. This happened within three hours. This is a typical situation in, in Beijing. 2006, when I was there in Beijing, we got up sometimes at 10. We saw a little light maybe at 11.30. And by 3 it was dark already. And after a rain, day of rain, we found out, oh no, there's a, a sunrise at 6. It was just so much smog there. That when the wind turns in the smog, you lose a complete daylight, and that was happened during this picture. Oh. Well, the, most, the most romantic castle in Germany. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the it's uh, Neuschwanstein, the Ludwig Castle of Germany. This is with a new tower in construction in New York, the Brooklyn Bridge. The Golden Gate. I mean, it's like coming here to Sydney. I mean, I was waiting for this trip maybe more than 10 years since we met, dreaming of getting to, to Sydney to photograph the opera. Yeah. So, yeah. That's Times Square at night. The Tokyo Tower. The Colosseum in Rome. Wow, it's so beautiful. Brandenburg Gate. Um. I say. Um. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Thomas. Are there, uh. are there other questions? Yes. As, as I looked at some of those plans, I, I, I almost felt that it was like um, uh, a composer's manuscript in the sense that the dotted notes will produce a sound and then you produce this matrix of pattern and form. Well, I think that the most important thing that I found was the contact sheet to treat as uh, a grid and like composition,al storyboard or like a music uh, composition. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I could not express on a storyboard is really the, the difference in angles. Yes. I have to do that like quickly. It's a rhythm. It's like when you learn writing, you do this exercise, right. yeah, and every line is different, and you try to do it the same. It never will be the same. Yeah. Uh, and I found out to create movement, and this is what I'm interested in, basically. How, how can I create movement? And movement is really based on this chaos. And chaos means I can have a rhythm, yes, but never the same angles. I'd love to set your pictures to Stockhausen. <laughs> I recently, that, that's really interesting, uh, I, I got a phone call from the German embassy in Beijing, and they said, well, can you please uh, send us pictures because we want you to represent Germany in an art fair of the countries in, in China. And I said, okay, I sent them. And I had a young woman dealing with, later found out she was an intern. And she then wanted to buy one of my pictures from Siegen, where I live, because her father was born there. Oh. And okay, well, you can barely afford that as a student. I don't want to tell you the price, really. Um, but can we make a deal? And 
and the deal was then that she paid part of the picture, and the other part was that she wrote an essay, because she was a music scientist, mm -hmm. and she wrote a wonderful article comparing uh, the work of John Cage okay. with my work. So yes. Stockhausen is the right direction. Yes. <laughs> I sort of wonder about fairly ignorant question, but you're only doing contact prints this big, but there's so much rich information in each negative. In a way, I would, I might, would like to look into that detail and see a larger print. No, just go closer to the picture. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You've never been tempted to print bigger. No, I mean, we did once, but uh, the, for me, it really is important to leave what you say, the maximum of information is in the contact print. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start enlarging, yeah. you lose yeah. things. Yeah. You don't make yeah. them more visible. You lose things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The contact print is really the so most obvious. dense. Look at old family albums. Yeah. Yeah. The, the six by nine black and white prints, how much information they have. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable. Use a magnifier if you like. Yeah. yeah? Um, <laughs> yeah. No. The, uh, the that we enlarge photography is, uh, you say, conven no, uh, lost the word. Con it's conventional. Yeah. Oh, well, it is now. The industry makes us believe that we need to enlarge a photo. Mm -hmm. Yes, bigger is better. Sorry? But for me, that is just said, but it's not true. So my decision from the very beginning was I decide for the final size of, of the image by using using how many, many roads. Yes. And it's sort yeah. of more of a precious object. Well, the precious object can be like this big when I use enough film. Mm. Yeah. So who processes your film? I'm working with consumer lab. Yeah. I'm using consumer film and I'm using a local consumer lab oh, okay. that uh, still have C41 processing. Right. Um, I'm very lucky that I have this family there because they are one of the large photo families in, in, in Germany. They um, also have like mini labs for processing whatever they do, photo books and so on. Um, yes, I'm lucky to use that. Kodak was trying to convince me for a long time to use professional material. Just, you're testing, one trip you're testing this material, next trip you're testing this material. You finally find the film that really f fits your, your vision of colors. Mm. Hey, they produce the film only three months. Yes. <laughs> and it's like, you know what? The film that you will produce the most longest uh, in the history of Kodak will be the consumer films. And I'm choosing the cheapest ones, fine. Do you only ever produce one image of each con one contact sheet, or do you do editions of contact? No, we do. I do editions. They're usually. I started the early works were edition of ten. Then, when I entered the American market, uh, the German galleries didn't want to raise the price, so we raised the edition to twenty for some time. But we found out that twenty is far too much. And so every new work that I'm doing since I think, since 2009 has only an edition of 12. What was the first fair? Was it the photo fair that went to? It was so great. Um, fairs? Oh, uh, no, the first fairs that I went to were like artist fairs in London, where you all kinds of artists went to. I think so. I was talking about Houston where you said you made all the contacts. Oh, you, oh, you mean the meeting places, portfolio yeah. meetings. That's, oh, okay. I, before, when I was a student, we, we, we traveled to south of France for painting, drawing, taking pictures, and I got to know about the festival in Arles, which is the oldest festival. And I always went there, and I found it quite frustrating to see how that there is like a couple of thousand people, and if you don't know anybody, mm. you don't know to shake which hand. Yeah, and you're sitting there at a table waiting that you meet someone who knows someone that put someone to the table and always got out something of, of, of that trips. But when I 
went to Houston and I found a meeting place, a portfolio meeting with these set meetings of 20 minutes. You get 20 meetings in four days. And in four days, five days that I was on my first time there, I came home with 60 business cards. And those 60 business cards really made, made my life. It was just 60 business cards. And since then I'm increasing that and I know that a career is really based on personal context. I find that's um, true. Because there's a lot of uh, artists here as well. Uh, I think it'd be nice to share how you maintain your connection with galleries. It's really um, uh, important and beautiful the way you um, mentioned it to me the other day. I was very impressed because I know Australian artists don't do that and they also don't know how to promote themselves and how to get out there. So I think it would be really good if you just could share that for a moment. I was very, very lucky during my studies that when we with students had to organize exhibitions at that time, the addresses were in a computer typewriter. So whenever we were organizing an exhibition, we had to go to the secretary, can you please print out the addresses? And the, she had no possibility of choosing addresses. So she had always to print out the whole thing. Oh, wow. And I asked a friend, well, is there a better solution? And uh, he recommended at that time uh, a software that was just invented two years before. And uh, I ran it as a black copy for many years. Today I have like a proper license. Um, <laughs> I'm, work, I'm working with uh, a client management software. So I try not to lose any contact. Not at all. So today there is uh, 8,000 contacts mm. in that database. It's all split up in, in keywords, in contact history, who, is, uh, who, who did I meet, where, and, and all that. When I come home from a travel, that's really a lot of work. But it's absolutely worth it. So when I press the button, I choose collectors. What's book, the software? Book. That's a German software, so, but you find that like CRM softwares, yeah. you find everywhere uh, different ones. You also find cloud versions today or connected to social media. Uh, but that was really helpful because not to lose a contact was really important. And to maintain the contact was for a long time in the beginning was sending out postcards for exhibitions. And you don't know who you meet where again and where I'm exhibiting. And so I try really, that, that is different to social media. I don't care much about that because I, I want to send out invitations to Sydney people when I'm in Sydney. Yeah, well, the US people will not come here yeah, for an exhibition. Maybe I let them know today by, by a newsletter. Um, and of course, we have seen 10 years now of uh, email marketing, which does not work anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm turning that back to paper. I'm sending really out uh, postcards. Uh, if it's for galleries, what do you mean is they get four times a year, they get a goodie, yeah? Like the handwritten postcard, uh, the Christmas card, uh, they get a book, they get a press release. Uh, there are certain groups that get uh, the newsletter not in email, they get the newsletter on paper. There's other groups that get only a Christmas card and so on. Mm. What, what, you was, but what he was saying is, yeah. uh, you didn't explain that now, what you explained to me the other day, there is a constant, uh, a constant um, maintenance of gallery contacts, and I think you said something like 160 were on market. Well, yeah, that, that's... Yeah, because uh, everybody uh, tells uh, tells you as an artist, make your homework. Mm. Yeah, which gallery does fit for your work? And I don't still believe that really, because a career is driven by personal contacts. But of course, I did that. I had an intern. I gave him uh, a cluster of how to search for galleries. And he searched for me galleries, uh, 1,700 galleries worldwide. And I had to look at 1,700 galleries online. Yeah, from 
New York to Sao Paulo to Kapstadt to uh, Cape Town to Dubai to Seoul, like the key cities in the world, and are really reduced it to 170. These 170 galleries are now on a mailing track. And this is the only chance. I mean, I cannot be every weekend in Tokyo and uh, Sao Paulo. I have no chance to meet those people in person, probably, but I can send them something. And when I get there, I try to meet as many as possible. I, this, on its own, is horrible. It costs a lot of money. It's probably something like ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year. But then they've heard of you when you arrive. Well, when they, hopefully, yeah. I mean, uh, galleries change. Uh, the staff members change. Uh, zeitgeist changes. Uh, whatever. The minute that they need something new or have a right theme of architecture collage or what, wherever I fit, they need to remember me. But it's also not that I think if you put some energy into something, it may come back to you. Or it comes from, from somewhere else. But it's the energy that you put in and uh, unfortunately in Australia uh, the artists are not taught to make that connection. They they, they hope to find a gallery and they do everything for them. And uh, I, my experience with international artists and Australian artists is like day and night. I feel I have to tell them all these things that are given to you and uh, to work together with a gallery, mm -hmm. like a tandem. And here the, the, the attitude or the consciousness, unfortunately, is they just dump it all mm -hmm. and leave it with the gallery and that's not how it works and then they wonder that they don't sell. Mm -hmm. It is uh, like, well, for instance, Stephen Roth, one of my Australian artists who lives in Tuscany and some of you know him. When he is here, he brings me everyday people. He never sold anything to any of them, but when my German collector came, he bought instantly three works of him and that was part of his effort as well. You see what I mean? If we work together to put the most into an exhibition, to contact as many people as possible, something comes of it from some angle. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would absolutely agree with you that, that um, there is a real passivity here. Yes. Um, somebody was saying to me recently that in publishing as well, unless you are a major publisher, when you publish a book, it's up to the author to promote it. It won't be done by the publisher. But there's, it, it, it's very difficult, it's, it, and it's partly that people think it's unseemly, and it's partly they can't be bothered. But there's another aspect to what Thomas does, which I think is, yes, it's hard work, and it's, it yeah. costs, and so on, but you don't know that from the end of receiving it. Thomas, ha it, it, what you can't do is annoy people with constantly battering on their door. You just have to be at the front of their mind. Yeah. And that's sort of like romance. You know, that's, that's a <laughs> subtle thing. And Thomas is really good at that. And that's not romancing in one way, one type of person. He has a style of doing it so that you are pre you're, ju you're putting yourself forward just enough to be in their sight, but you're not pushing yourself into their face all the time because that produces an equal and opposite reaction. So it's, it, 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 it involves the energy, but it also involves subtlety and it involves strategy. It's marketing, essentially. Oh, he's marketing on an per interpersonal basis yeah, yeah. because he's selling precious items to individuals rather than types of mass-produced items to types of people. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's also, uh, I, I cannot confront someone, I never know when is the right time. Uh, I really need to stay in contact, as loose as that yeah. is, because uh, I might need you at one point. It's like in this Russian project, for, for example, I was working with a Russian museum, but from the very beginning I was sure the most important person with the best knowledge to write an essay for me was not the curator of that museum. Yeah? yeah. So I had to be very careful on that and to, to develop the concept of how can these curators still write uh, contribute uh, a text for the book, but of course
course, I want a long-term relation to Irina that I have, have as a professor for the history of geography from Moscow. I want her to write the, the main essay for the book. And of course I got her. It was a phone call. Irina, yeah. would you mind? Would you like? I said, immediately she said yes. Well, well, she was three months late with delivery, but doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's creating a relationship. It's, it's relationships. It's creating relation to someone, and you, you feel yourself where it's going to hook on to something or where it's promising. But it's a kind of, that's my work as a gallerist. It's constantly connecting and creating relations. And if there is no relation, as such, there is no reason why I should interact with you. Yeah. So it's actually creating a history. Yeah, it's like, it's like uh, Which you, where you all, the, all, the, all the PR work, yeah? I mean, in the beginning of the career, you find out the galleries, the museums, they are only sending out postcards locally. That only serving local press. Yeah, damn. Damn it. I mean, I, I want national press. Yes, I want international press for my work, wherever I can. So, okay, which magazines? Well, why? Get them on the list. Yeah, get them on the mailing list. Make the researches. Times have changed. Who are the most important bloggers? Get them on your mailing list. Yeah, send them stuff. Yeah, ask them. Yeah, knock on their doors because I don't want to send this by email. I want it to send it by paper. I want to have it stick on your table. Not on your desktop. Yeah. You can get fatigued from too much social media. Right? You know, like some is okay. I have used it myself. Social. I'm media, using it extensively. You get fatigued in, after a while. You just. I need time out from it. You know, I can't always be. People are different. I mean, uh, I'm looking at me, and I'm looking at younger generations also. Yeah, true. Uh, I know my clients are a certain age. And there is, but there is also younger groups that I have to reach. So we have to change our vantage points, our behaviors, and search for new ways of, of communication. Problem is, my day is limited to so many hours. When I was 30, I was doing days of 16, 18 hours. Today, I don't know, I cannot. I mean, I, we are all working very close to a burnout situation. Always. So you have to be very careful with yourself and keep yourself in a very stable situation. Um, so don't do too much. But you have to see the tasks and then find interns or employ staff to get this done. On that note. Oh, just a question. Jim, <laughs> 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 um, to do with construction, deconstruction, and construction. If we look at one of your prints that you have for sale, we look at the image, say, of the Eiffel Tower or the, the um, you know, Tower Bridge or something, mm. and wonder what it would look like if you eliminated the vertical lines and the horizontal perforated lines, and what it would look like without the grid. Well, then you have the white grid. Pardon? Then you have a white Grid. Well, you have a picture, you have a picture, a wonderfully distorted picture of the Tower Bridge without the grid. No, 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 listen. No, I am. What, 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 what happens? Are, are you close the gaps. Are you want to close the gaps? Yeah, Ooh. get rid of the gap. Look, I have a friend, my friend Leonard Bush, he's a painter. He was always known throughout his life as a grid painter. I've seen his recent work. He has eliminated, finally, after years and years and years <laughs> of work, he has eliminated the grid. But his paintings really are the same but without the grid. So I'm just wondering what, I'd be very interested to look at your picture of Stonehenge without sure. the grid. Well, it you know, you no, 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 makes your work even more <laughs> mysterious <laughs> than it is. No, the wonderful How thing, did he get that? No, mm -hmm. the wonderful thing you're concealing is, your process. Here you're not concealing your process. Your, your technique is very much in your face. The, the, one, the, the perforated horizontal and the, the and the the cut is the vertical. The wonderful thing is, there is other artists who do that, <laughs> not just me. <laughs> no, I'm just wondering if you've ever thought of that. <laughs> of course, I mean, of course, I've, I've you can still of that. talk about the process that you got. That you've taken one extra step. That's right. 
Of course. No, I don't think that it's an extra step. Um, well, it's a deconstruction. You got no, it's, a, it's, it's a different work, it's a different step. Yes. But my, this, I think a big part of the success that I'm having is to keep a coherent body of work, a very consistent body of what I'm working on. And the people identify the work with me. And of course, in my life, I'm close to 50, there will be changes. Of course. But I'm not telling you when, and life will tell me when this is going to happen. I think in, in no, no, the charm, of course, in your work is the arcane process. That's, all, that's, well, that's the charm. That's why you sell. And that's why it's so wonderful. I mean, I'm not criticizing you in any way. <laughs> But also in painting, there's the notion of painterliness, which is different from simple representation. It's, it's actually making clear that you're using paint to make the picture and not simply to create like a photorealistic picture. Mm -hmm. So I can understand why the materiality of the medium is something that um, Thomas wants to keep at the forefront of your mind, you know, not to, in a sense, allow suspension of disbelief but to actually force you to look at that. I would say, though, that if they stop making film and you, you continue in something similar with digital, you, you may well get to that situation because you won't have this physical material with, with gaps in. Um, That's just if a we still have the time, we want to give you uh, a little treat downstairs. Yes. Yeah. I, I also bring my sketchbook and yeah. you see okay. like um, what I do after processing the films, there are collars of the index prints that are still tactile that go exactly in that direction. And I'm, s I'm also selling these products, of course. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, of course, you've, I've seen the Harbour Bridge done in a new digital way with, with all the distortions of things. You can, you know, you can buy the Sydney Herald magazine and see the Harbour Bridge done like that, but without the charm of your, the way you incredibly. You know, Incredible way that you've done what you've done. So, you know, I've said it too. Anyway, so I'm, just continue the conversation. Uh, yes, so I was, I was just going to wrap up this bit and, and uh, so thank, you to, so thank you very much. Yeah. This will make Kirsty smile and I'll explain <laughs> why later. But if I've got the philosopher right, it is said that Hegel said that architecture was frozen music. And I think that what you do is take architecture and put the music back into it. So, there you go. Um, now, we, we have a great privilege because Connie and the artists have agreed that we can have a pre-preview and go down and look at the exhibition that actually doesn't open until tomorrow night. So um, Connie will show us um, in the nicest way where to go. Yeah.